Hello folks, uh, this is Mr. R. Murray uh, with my next series on Canadian history for my grade 11 students. Uh, today I want to spend some time talking about pre-contact Canada. So this video will focus on the lives of Indigenous people in Canada before the arrival of the first Europeans. So we will look at both the uh, traditional indigenous teachings on how uh, people came to this land as well as the archaeological evidence about how it happened and then we'll take a look at some of the major indigenous groups in the country and something about what their lives were like before the influence of European colonization. Um, before we get into pre-contact, I want to just take a moment to review proper terminology. So there's usually some confusion as to the terms Indian, Aboriginal, Indigenous, and First Nation. So there are specific ways that these terms should be used now, um, beginning with Indian. Uh, this is a completely outdated term for Canada's Indigenous people. As a rule, it should only be used in relation to legal terms. For example, when referring to the Indian Act. Um, Aboriginal, this is a generic term referring to the first peoples of a particular country. In Canada, it's not generally used anymore in favor of the term indigenous. Indigenous is the proper term to be used when referring to the original inhabitants of Canada as a whole. Whereas First Nation is a general reference to Canadian Indigenous groups except for Inuit and Métis, which should always be identified separately. Um, also when possible, a specific group such as Cree, Mohawk, Assiniboine, Blackfoot, etc should be uh, identified specifically rather than use the term First Nation. So uh, the beginning of humanity will go way, way back here. Uh, according to the archaeological evidence, uh, the earliest humans first arrived in Central Africa um, approximately three and a half million years ago. From there, Human beings uh, slowly migrated across the world as they continued to evolve, constantly in search of food and water, living largely as groups of nomadic hunters and gatherers. Continuing to spread out, human beings would group together in various regions, again continuing to evolve and doing so based on the needs of the environments they found themselves in. The first permanent human settlements were established around 7500 before Common Era in what is known as the Fertile Crescent, which is a region that covers modern Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, and Israel. And this is where humans finally learned to farm and domesticate livestock. Now, this map is slightly out of date in terms of when human beings arrived in North America. Um, evidence has been discovered showing that uh, North American indigenous people arrived considerably sooner than merely 12,000 years ago. But it still gives a pretty good idea as to when we started 3.6 million years in Central Africa and roughly how we spread out across the globe and over what approximate time frames. As for Canada's Indigenous people, um, roughly between 10,000 and 20,000 years ago, the ancestors of Canada's Indigenous people found themselves on what was called Beringia. Beringia was a land bridge that was located between modern Siberia, Russia, and Alaska, United States. N near the end of the last ice age, sea levels were quite low, exposing much of what is now the sea floor in that region, and the entire area was surrounded on all sides by glacial ice. 
um, about 11,000 years ago, as the ice started to melt and sea levels rose in this area, the people here began to move further east, crossing the remainder of the land bridge. They followed herds, uh, herds of large mammals, such as mammoths, musk ox, giant beavers, and ancient reindeer as a source for food. Some groups traveled by foot uh, across the Rocky Mountains, and as we can see from this map, slowly made their way south into the United States and eventually South America. Uh, we also believe that other groups may have traveled by sea during this time in primitive boats and moved down the coast of North and Central America. Now, Old Crow Flats and the nearby Bluefish Caves in the northern part of the Yukon are sites of the evidence of the oldest areas of human habitation in Canada. Um, here, human and human worked animal remains uh, have been found here that date nearly 24,000 years ago. And what we mean by human worked is things such as uh, the existence of tool marks, bite marks, that sort of thing on the bones of these animals. Um, this does suggest that while around 11,000 years ago there was a large group trapped on the Bering uh, land bridge, some groups of early First Nations people, First Peoples, had made it to North America before the glaciers isolated that region uh, around the Bering Strait. Now, Turtle Island is uh, a story that discusses the traditional arrival, uh, not the scientific arrival, of indigenous people to North America. Um, now, the turtle ha is significant in many indigenous traditions for a variety of reasons. Um, but in particular, uh, it serves as a additional or as an uh, traditional annual calendar. If you take a look at this image, you'll notice that on a turtle's back, and if you've ever seen a turtle or have a turtle, you could actually look at it right now and count these. Uh, but there are 13 central scales on a turtle's back, and these scales are surrounded by 28 smaller ones. And in total, these represent um, a calendar. This is how early indigenous people uh, counted uh, the days, um, creating a total of 364 days for the year. So the 13 central scales refer to the 13 lunar cycles in a calendar year, where the 28 border scales refer to the average number of days in a lunar cycle. And depending on the indigenous nation, the remaining day, the 365th day of a calendar year, is often used as a festival day, uh, typically held sometime mid-year at the peak of the growing season. Uh, the turtle is also uh, a symbol for truth-based teachings, and as I said, it's a central figure in this traditional story of the creation of North America and how indigenous people uh, came here in the first place. Now, the story uh, has some variants, again, depending on the group, but uh, in general terms, how it goes is, you know, people, animals, they lived on the world, you know, progressed as, you know, they were progressing, but there was a lot of infighting. You know, a lot of harming of the land, a lot of unnecessary harming of the world, fighting with each other. And the uh, one of the indigenous gods, indigenous creators, sometimes referred to as Kichi Manitou, decided to punish humankind for their arrogance and set a great flood across the world. So in this way, we can see that, you know, there is a similar great flood tradition in indigenous teachings that there are in the Bible or in ancient Greek uh, mythology and many other cultures around the world. So as the story goes, there's this flood and almost all of humanity is wiped out. There's a single man, uh, sometimes referred to as 
Nanabhuzu, and after the flood, he finds himself in the waters that now cover the planet. Um, he comes across a floating log and climbs upon it in order to stay dry. Now, he's not the only survivor. There are several animals that survive as well. Uh, a whooping crane, a turtle, a muskrat, a duck, uh, and some others, depending on the version of the story. So while floating, these animals come up to the log, and Nanabozo decides to um, share his log. Gets off the log, allows some of the animals to take turns getting up on it in order to get out of the water and stay dry. And this is something that uh, repeats itself for a while. And then suddenly Nanabozo uh, comes up with this idea. He thinks that if they are able to get to the bottom of this new flooded, this flooded area and grab a ball of mud, uh, he could possibly, you know, praying to Kichimanitu, could use it in order to create a new land that they could all live upon. So he tries first. He dives under the water, tries to get to the bottom, starts to drown, can't make it, comes back up. Next, various animals take turns. And most of these animals have experience living in the waters, which is why they're the few survivors. So the whooping crane, uh, try it, the whoop, you know, the whooping crane dives down, can't find it. The turtle dives down, can't get to it. Uh, the duck dives down, can't do, get to it. And then suddenly this tiny little muskrat says, you know what, I can hold my breath for a long time. I bet I can get down there. And the other animals that are sitting there are you know laughing and poking fun at him, thinking, well, if we can't make it, there's no way you're going to make it, little muskrat. And Nanabozo, in his wisdom, goes, you know what? How do we really know? If he wants to try, let him try. So the muskrat dives down, reaches the bottom, grabs a ball of mud, and starts making his way to the surface. All the while, uh, straining for air, his lungs feel like they're going to explode, and eventually he does succumb to the waters and drowns as he makes his way back to the surface. Um, arriving on the surface, uh, the animals, uh, sad, you know, start to mourn the muskrat, and Nanabozo notices that within his paw he holds a ball of mud. Um, having successfully reached the bottom. He takes the ball of mud and starts looking for somewhere to place it in, in order to grow this new land. And at this point, the turtle volunteers himself and says, you know what, you know, the muskrat gave himself, uh, gave a great sacrifice for us. I should do no less. I can bear the weight, place the ball of mud on my back. So Nanabozo does, puts the ball of mud on the turtle's back, offers a prayer to Kishu Manitou, and then the four winds arrive and start blowing across the turtle. The land begins to expand, and it expands more and more and more and more, until finally it creates this giant new continent that we now think of as Turtle Island, but traditionally the indigenous people in this, many indigenous people in this country refer to as Turtle Island. So it's uh, a really wonderful creation story. And it, um, as is the case with many indigenous stories, it's a morality tale. It speaks to being generous, to not judging people by their appearance. And more importantly, most importantly, um, the idea of sacrificing yourself for the sake, for the benefit of others. So there, that is the traditional and the scientific uh, versions of how indigenous people came to this land before Europeans. So now let's spend a bit of time in this video looking, as I said, at the life of indigenous people in Canada before European contact. So first, let's take a look at a term called Pan-Indianism. Um, this is a very outdated stereotype, a very outdated term. It implies that all indigenous people are the same, and it is absolutely not true. 
you know, all indigenous people have the same language, the same spiritual beliefs, the same way of dressing, uh, eat the same foods, live in the same type of houses, and this is absolutely not the case. While many indigenous nations in Canada have shared aspects of various ways of life, uh, for example, uh, many indigenous people um, have a version of the medicine wheel, and many indigenous people use feathers and beading in their traditional dress and ceremonial costumes. Uh, that is not the case all across the board. And all indigenous groups in Canada have some cultural uniqueness. There is some aspect of their traditional ways of life that separates them from other indigenous people whether again it's language or things like uh, a reference to the creator or uh, a reason for why the sun sets the way it does, that kind of thing. Now it's estimated that at the time of first European contact there were somewhere around two million people, uh, indigenous, two million indigenous people living in what would eventually become the nation of Canada. And at this time, there may have been close to 250 individual First Nation languages, including several non-spoken sign languages. Uh, many of these languages have gone extinct, and today there are less than 75. Uh, some of the major indigenous groups that I'm going to review in this video, there are certainly many more, uh, include the Salish people, the uh, Algonquin people, the Iroquois, the Inuit, the Haida, the Bayatuk, the Mi'kmaq, the Wendat, the Dakota, and the Cree. And as you'll see, they all have their uh, own individual differences and nuances in terms of how they lived before European contact. So we'll begin with the Salish. Um, originating in the Pacific Northwest, from the lower mainland of British Columbia to Vancouver Island and down into the United States. Um, in the spring and summer, when it was warm, the Salish habitually traveled in small groups to hunt and fish, and they would live in temporary camps as they went from place to place. In the winters, they would establish more permanent plank houses that would be constructed of cedar, and these would become their permanent winter camps. And again, once the weather warmed up, they would travel, continue to do what they did during the warmer months, and would eventually come back to these uh, plank houses uh, come the winter months again in order to uh, stay in the one place while the months were colder. Um, women har typically harvested various fruit, berries, and nuts to supplement their diets, and the salmon was especially revered to the Salish, both as a staple of their diets and as a spiritual totem. And in many Salish forms of art, uh, the salmon is a prominent uh, figure. Uh, the potlash was also a major ceremony in Salish culture and continues to be today. Uh, even though during the entirety of the residential school era, it had been banned by Canada's federal government. It involved a senior member of the group re redistributing his or her personal belongings to the rest of his band or her band. And that included clothing, weapons, tools, blankets, everything they owned as a show of communal generosity and sharing. Um, as a result, uh, the person gifting their belongings would be honored with a feast that involved dancing and singing and drumming and could last for many days. The person being honored would also enjoy an increase in status among the rest of their community uh, for their generosity and selflessness. Next we have the Bayatuk. Um, originally from Newfoundland, these were likely the very first indigenous group to encounter Europeans, the Vikings. Uh, one of the smaller indigenous groups, it's believed that at the time of European contact, only around 1,000 people uh, lived uh, among the Bayatuk. They lived in hide-covered tents in the warmer months and would create partially 
subterranean dugout lodges to make it through the harsh winters on the island. Uh, primarily coastal, they fished and hunted sea mammals such as birds for food. They would also use bows and arrows to occasionally hunt caribou more inland. The Bayatak were the origin of the Red Indian description, uh, common to how indigenous people in Canada are, are looked at as a whole, being red skin. Um, the Bayatak were heavy users of a mineral called hematite, which was used in dyes, which would they would use to paint their bodies, their canoes, and other traditionally used objects red, hence the name Red Indian. Um, because of their interactions with Europeans, the Bayatuck went extinct as a people around 1829. Uh, a woman named Shauna Dithit, uh, more often referred to as Nancy April, was the last known member and actually created something of a visual and partially written record of the traditional ways of her people before we, she passed on. Now we have the Algonquian people. Uh, the Algonquian is actually a larger group of many indigenous nations, and their territory covered most of eastern Canada, including Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, moving into central Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and eastern Alberta. Um, the Algonquin group includes uh, smaller indigenous nations, such as the Ojibwe, the Cree, the Odawa, the Mali Seat, and the Blackfoot people. Uh, many Algonquin nations have a shared belief system, such as the Seven Grandfather teachings, the Medicine Wheel, Sun Dancing, and Sweat Lodges. Uh, for most Algonquin people, hunting has been the main means of survival. However, for some, such as those whose lands existed around the Great Lakes, um, farming had been heavy relied upon since around 500 CE. Uh, for Algonquian tribes, planting and harvesting what's known as the Three Sisters, so that's corn, squash, and beans. They were a central part of ceremony as well as their calendar. Uh, you know, planting, sowing, harvesting, storing seasons uh, were all linked very much to the Algonquian calendar for the peoples in that region. Um, for the Ojibwe in southern Ontario and Quebec, rice was a staple of their diets. Now, the Mi'kmaq, like the Bayatuk, or Mi'kmaq, as they are sometimes referred to, uh, they also originated on Canada's east coast, primarily New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Quebec along the St. Lawrence River. Uh, the Mi'kmaq people can trace their possession of their traditional lands in these areas as far back as 10,000 years. Of the 30 known Mi'kmaq nations, 29 reside entirely within Canada's modern borders. And the Mi'kmaq, they've always had very close spiritual ties to Canada's coastal waters. And even today, marine sustainability, such as lobster fishing, is at the heart of their collective way of life. Also, like many indigenous groups, the Mi'kmaq use various art forms to describe and celebrate their spiritual connections to the natural world. However, where other nations such as the Algonquin or the Iroquois use beadwork in clothing and other items, the Mi'kmaq people employed dyed porcupine quills in theirs. Uh, Mi'kmaq quill work is very intricate it can use hundreds of individual quills, and that quill work is used in everything from clothing to furniture, uh, medicine containers, canoes, and all sorts of other items. And you, know, you can see here the image is one such example of just how brightly colored and how detailed these quill designs can be. Next, we have the Iroquois. So it is another one of the larger language groups, um, also sometimes referred to as the Haudenosaunee. The Iroquois included the Mohawk, Oneida, Cayuga, and Seneca nations. And they originate from around the Great Lakes region of North America, and they existed on either side of the Canadian-U.S. border. 
their name means people of the longhouse. And this refers to the type of traditional dwelling they lived in. There's an image of one here. So you had these you know, rather long uh, you know, plank and thatched houses, uh, lodges, uh, which were permanent multi-family dwellings. So you would have a community, a village, and each, uh, you know, each family or multiple related families would uh, live in these houses as a uh, smaller group within the community. Um, they were essential during the fur trade era. Uh, the Iroquois served as scouts, translators, hunters, helped make alliances with other neighboring groups, and helped European newcomers at that time survive uh, Canada's long, harsh winters by uh, you know, providing food that they had stored from themselves, showing them where certain medicines could be found, that sort of thing. The Iroquois were expert beaters and would stitch together belts uh, called wampum. Now these belts were made up of very intricate designs, there are some examples on the screen here, using tube-shaped beads, typically they were blue and white, but they might be made of other colors as well, and they were made from the shells of various marine animals. Um, these belts have a number of uses. They could be used as a form of currency, they were used to record historical and cultural knowledge, and they served as contracts for treaties and alliances between other indigenous groups. Next we have the Wendat, uh, also known as the Wyandot or the Huron Wendat. They were an Iroquois nation specific to the northern shores of today's Lake Ontario. And while they did speak a dialect of Iroquois, they were often enemies of other Haudenosaunee nations in that region. Um, between conflicts with their various Iroquois neighbors and epidemics brought to Canada by Europeans such as smallpox, their population went from 25,000 to a little over 9,000 uh, between the years of 1600 and 1640. So they, they were really, really badly affected by European contact. Um, they were one of the few indigenous groups that relied almost entirely on farming and fishing to survive because the region's hunting grounds were generally located within the territory of their many neighboring um, enemy nations that they were constantly in conflict with. Conflict with. Um, the Wendat were matrilineal, meaning that ancestral connections and property were passed down through the women of the family instead of the men. Um, also, Wendat families were divided into eight different clans. Each clan would claim to be descended from a common animal named ancestor. So you had the beer clan, bear clan, the deer clan, turtle clan, beaver clan, hawk clan, fox clan, wolf clan, and the loon clan, sometimes also called the sturgeon clan. Uh, marriage was only permitted outside your ancestral clan. So, for example, two members of the Hawk clan could not marry each other, but a member of a Hawk clan could marry someone from the Wolf clan. Next, we have the Inuit or Inui. Um, this is Canada's indigenous people who originally inhabited the land, water, and ice of the northernmost part of the country in what is now the Yukon, Northwest, and Nunavut territories. There are also Inuit groups living in Siberia, Russia, and Greenland. The main Inuit language is called Inuktitut, and it has five distinct dialects depending on the region that you are in. Um, Inuit subsisted largely on fishing and hunting sea animals such as seals, whales, and polar bears. Um, their diet may have also included caribou, duck, and assorted berries when they were available. Uh, the use of ice lodges or igloos in the winter months were common. However, despite the stereotype that they only ever lived in igloos, um, in warmer weather the Inuit would live in huts um, covered in seal hide. 
Given the huge barren landscape of the Arctic, a common practice of the Inuit was to erect markers called Anukshuks. Anukshuks are designed, as you can see from this image, to be human shaped and made up of several flat stones placed on top of each other. Uh, they served as guideposts for travel, um, so it would actually you know, provide something of a visual path across this big, empty, frozen landscape. Uh, they would also serve to mark ceremonial locations, uh, favored campgrounds, hunting grounds, and the locations of food storage. Continuing on, we have the Dakota people. Until around 1200 CE, the Dakota people uh, inhabited the area around today's Manitoba and Ontario's southern borders. Uh, from there, they migrated west, settling near the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border and also south into the United States along the Mississippi River. They relied very heavily, heavily on the buffalo as a source of food, tools, clothing, and other needed items. And the Dakota also lived in semi-permanent villages, which would be used as locations to grow and harvest wild rice at certain times of the year. Um, the Dakota were one of many First Nations groups that practiced the Sundance ceremony. Uh, the Sundance, it was always held at a specific shared location and was overseen by a shaman or a medicine man. Uh, it would be held whenever an individual was willing to offer their blood as a sacrifice for something the community needed from the creator, such as uh, good growing weather or uh, more plentiful uh, hunting animals. Uh, using hooks or wood pegs, the individual would pierce their flesh and attach themselves around a central pole. They would then dance around it to drum music until the hooks or pegs were torn free from their body. The scars that resulted were considered a mark of honor for that person in the eyes of their community, They're willing to put themselves through that discomfort to shed blood in order to possibly obtain something from the creator that would benefit everybody. Uh, the next group we're going to talk about are the Haida. They are another First Nation from Canada's west coast. Uh, the Haida inhabited the islands, various inlets and coastline around British Columbia's Haida Gwaii as far back as 9,000 years ago. And there's a map here that shows you exactly where Haida Gwaii was, or is. Uh, the Haida were divided into two social groups, the Raven and Eagle clans. They fished, hunted grizzly bear, and would often trade with neighboring groups. They lived in very small family-based villages and each village claimed ancestral ownership of uh, specific resources, whether it was a salmon stream, a hunting ground, a tobacco field, or some other, some other area. And these ancestral property zones were known to other neighboring Haida and were respected by those other Haida groups. So if a person ancestrally claimed stake to say a tobacco field, uh, well, the other Haida groups would know that this particular tribe, you know, that was their ancestral ground. They would not come in, try to steal the tobacco, or just destroy the land in any sort of way. Uh, totem poles were used by the Haida uh, as a means of recording clan and family histories. They also told spiritual legends and teachings and would record important events. They were carved by hand from trunks of various trees in the region, mostly western red cedar because of how soft the wood was and easy to carve. They may have been brightly painted, um, in some cases yes, in some cases no, but they always featured various animal or human faces like the example you see here and could stand as high as 20 meters depending on their purpose and use. Uh, finally, uh, spend a little time talking about the Cree. Now, the Cree were part of the larger Algonquin family group, and they originally occupied much of northern Ontario, most of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and northern Alberta. Primarily, they lived in small family groups for protection, or bands. Uh, the men were hunters, and the women beaded clothing, ceremonial objects, 
uh, gathered nuts, berries, that sort of thing. Uh, their homes were either cone-shaped, referred to as teepees, or dome-shaped, referred to as lodges. And they were framed with wooden poles and covered in animal hides. Um, during the summer months, they would travel by canoe and into winter months by toboggan. They were one of several indigenous groups who would later interbreed with arriving Europeans and give birth to the Métis nation. Uh, like the Dakota, Cree people relied very heavily on the buffalo or bison for their way of life. It provided everything they needed from food to hides, medicine, tools, etc. In some areas, like Head Smashed in Alberta, the buffalo jump was a common practice. Uh, what would happen would be a group of hunters would drive a herd of bi bison towards a steep cliff while other hunters remained at the base of that cliff. The animals uh, would jump over and would either die immediately upon impact because of how steep the cliff was or be incapacitated enough for the uh, hunters waiting below to finish the kill with very little or no resistance. Now the last slide is actually an image of a buffalo and uh, just describing some of the various uses. You know, the buffalo was literally, for many groups on the prairies, the Cree, Dakota, and others, uh, a go-to source for pretty much everything they needed. So uh, we'll just go through it quickly. So you have the buckskin. Um, so this was used for moccasins, cradles, winter robes, bedding, shirts, leggings, belts, dresses, pipe bags, quivers, teepee covers, gun covers, pouches, dolls, all kinds of things. Anything that needed hide, you know, the buffalo hide was used for. Um, you had the meat, pretty much every part of the animal that was edible could be eaten and uh, it would often be used to help create pemmican, uh, hump ribs, or a form of dried jerky. Um, you had the mussels, which um, could be uh, broken down and used as glue, sinew for bows, thread, arrows, cinches. Okay. Rawhide was used for containers, shields, buckets, moccasins, belts, headdresses, medicine bags, drums, ropes, saddles, stirrups, quilts, knife cases, armbands, bullet pouches. Um, the buffalo brain was used as a way of, t was used as a, a, as a substance to help tan the hides. You had the horns that could be hollowed out and used as cups or fire carriers. They would be carved into spoons, uh, powder containers, uh, ladles, uh, child toys, uh, signals, headdresses. Um, the skull was often kept and used as a part of prayer ceremonies. Uh, the tongue, this was the best, apparently the best meat on the animal, um, the most desired, uh, and was often, you know, saved for the elders of the group. You had the beard of the bison, which was used ornamentally for clothing or weapons. You had the hair, which would be used for hairdresses, saddle pad filter, ropes, pillows, that sort of thing. Um, the hooves and feet could be melted down and used as a form of glue or carved into baby rattles. The stomach was turned into uh, storage buckets, cups, dishes, cooking pots. Uh, the animal's bladder uh, was used as pouches for sinew, uh, quill pouches or small medicine bags. Uh, the bones were uh, used as uh, the hilts for knives, for carved into arrowheads, used as shovels, as hide scrapers, uh, rungs on winter sleds, carved into war clubs, uh, splints for injuries, used as gaming dice, so, you know, lots of uses. Um, the hind leg skin was commonly used as mo in moccasins or boots because it was pretty much already shaped that way. 
Uh, you had the fat of the animal, which was used as uh, soap, uh, could be used in soaps or used as a cooking oil. Uh, the tail, which would be removed and used as either a decoration or it could be used as a fly swatter or a web or some kind of a, a medicinal switch. And then finally the buffalo sh chip or you know the, the animal's poop, its feces. Uh, it was used as fuel for ceremonial fires. It was used for ceremonial smoking. It was used for long distance signaling. So even the feces of the animal was, was used uh, quite extensively for various things. So there we go. Um, you know, somewhat longer video, but this gives you a, a pretty good look at just how different um, all the different indigenous groups were and some of the key aspects about you know, where they were, how they lived, uh, you know, foods that they ate, homes that they lived in. Um, for me, uh, indigenous culture is, is truly uh, something to be explored and something to be appreciated. And I, for one, hope you've gained something of that uh, appreciation and respect watching this video. Thank you.